started in the last two years of making 3D models with photogrammetry. And those aren't available online yet, but we're working on making those available online. So you'll be able to download them, uh, play with them on your computer, or even print them off if you have a 3D printer at home. Um, but uh, that probably won't happen. They won't probably get up online until sometime this winter or, or springtime uh, next year. So when people come to the Field Museum, of course, they think of Sue the T-Rex. I have nothing to do with that. <laughs> They think of uh, maybe Maximo or the pterosaurs. Again, I have nothing to do with these things. They're most impressive. Or all the whole dinosaurs in Dinosaur Hall. Or the Ice Age mammals. And again, nothing to do with that. I'm working with invertebrates. So we don't have a lot. They're not, they don't take up, they're not the most spectacular things on display, although this is really nice. This is our trilobite display when you come in. And it's also arranged, just a little tidbit that people miss, but these are the oldest ones, Cambrian. Then we get Ordovician, Silurian, Devonian. And then there's not very many, but we have uh, Permian and uh, Carboniferous ones over here. I think there's just three of them, maybe four. Um, and so they're arranged in geologic order in this little circle. Um, but that's what I work on, are fossil invertebrates. And so a couple questions. Um, what are fossils? And people sometimes get a little confused. I, bringing a lot of kids to the, the collections, and I ask them what is a fossil, and the first thing they say is, it's a bone turned to stone. And people get confused a little bit, and they often think that a fossil has to be stone. It doesn't have to be, it can be. But there's lots of other things, like insects trapped in amber, or a woolly mammoth in ice, those are all fossils. And really, my definition is kind of simple. It's any evidence of ancient life. And you can argue about what ancient is, but I would say 10,000 years or older. There are a few exceptions you can find I think some mammoth bones up in the island off of Norway that are about 6,000 years old, and I would argue that those are fossils because paleontologists study them. And you can find mummified cats in pyramids that might be four, five, six thousand years old. I would argue those are not fossils because archaeologists would study them. <laughs> but most of what I work on is hundreds of millions of years old, and there's no real uh, worry about that. <laughs> so really ancient stuff. Mostly you get the hard parts, bone, teeth, and shells. But here in Illinois, we have the Maison Creek uh, thing. So one of the few places in the world, about a dozen of them, where we get soft-bodied animals preserved. The, you don't really get the actual tissue, but you get an impression of the tissue and stuff preserved, like jellyfish and worms, and that's really unusual. And we're kind of lucky to live so close to a place like that. So a lot of our collection is a, one of the, the gems of our collection that a lot of people, researchers around the world, come to see is the Maison Creek uh, fossils. And then also fossils could include behaviors like uh, burrows or trackways, insects in amber, Coprolite is the polite and fancy way of saying fossilized poop. <laughs> we have two cabinets full of fossilized poop. People ask, why would you do that? But you can learn a lot about an animal by looking at that. You can see what they ate. You can sometimes find little bits of shells and, and plant fossils in there that you might not find in the regular deposits. So you can preserve stuff differently there. So you can actually learn quite a bit from fossilized poop. And then now we're going to go into invertebrate animals, are animals without a backbone. So most animals we see on a daily basis, cows, cats, dogs, us, are all backbones. And most of the stuff you see at a zoo, birds, fish, alligators, all have backbones. But the invertebrates far outnumber the vertebrates by a huge amount. And uh, I got down the main groups, and we're going to kind of go through each group. I got pictures of fossils from all of them. Yep. What's that you're holding? That is a big uh, fossil shell from uh, Paris or somewhere near in France. Is that a copper line? Is that a piece? No, that's another smaller shell in the same genus. So this is just a smaller one. I'm not sure why I wanted two of them together. It's kind of precarious, but I did that anyways. Um, but yeah, those are from the Eocene in the Paris Basin of France. All right, so. So the first group, not a lot of fossils. You can picture sponges are not the most uh, hard parts, but we do occasionally get sponge fossils. Preserved. We have a nice Ordovician one. Um, this would have been a complete circle, but it's broken. It's kind of a weird shape. And you can find these in, in Ohio. And then these are Devonian glass sponges. And you can see maybe the, the kind of grid framework squares going up there. That would have been silica that would have been in there forming the spicules that gave it a sort of a framework to hold the sponge up. And you can find those in the in, uh, Devonian of New York. Well, I forgot protozoa. So these are foraminifera. These are called pneumolites because they look sort of like coins. And uh, these are from Egypt. And if you go and visit the Great Pyramids of Egypt, 
the big limestone blocks the pyramids are made of are fossiliferous, and they have these fossils in those. So you can find uh, pneumolites, uh, foraminifera shells, in the, the Great Pyramids of Egypt. And uh, you can see they have this spiral pattern that goes through where the animal went through. And they're sort of foraminifera are still alive today. They're kind of like an amoeba, but they have a little test, a shell that they ooze through. And I was talking a little bit earlier about uh, in Japan, there's a beach by Okinawa that has um, these star-shaped uh, grains of sand. They're about the size of a sand grain. And those are the shells uh, from these foraminifera that get washed up on the beach. And then here we got some Maison Creek going into Nidaria. The Nidarias include the jellyfish, the sea anemones, and the corals. And so normally you don't get a whole lot of soft-bodied uh, anemones and stuff, but we have the Cubozoan uh, from the Maison Creek, and it has tentacles on the four corners. That's why it's kind of Cubozoan has a, whoops, a full four-fold four symmetry. And then a lot of people are probably familiar with this as Essexella, and I, they might think I have it upside down, but work by Roy Plotnick at the University of, Chicago, uh, University of Illinois, Chicago, uh, they actually think it's now a sea anemone, and that we've had it upside down the whole time, and that this is one of the most common fossils at the Maison Creek, so it's kind of amazing, but we think this is probably the base, these are some of the muscles, and then here would be the little uh, arms from the sea anemone, and when they die, they kind of curl up inside. I keep hitting some button. Uh, and so now we think that this is probably a sea anemone. It used to be classified as a skirted jellyfish, which sounds good, uh, but there's really no such thing as a skirted jellyfish in, in today's world. No one knows what one is. And people tried to do tests if you had a skirt around a jellyfish, how would it swim and stuff, and no one could figure that out. So it, it seemed, makes more sense as probably a sea anemone than a skirted jellyfish. And then we have a lot of different corals. This one is kind of famous, the hexagonaria. Um, the one on my side is the um, one from Iowa, and it's unpolished. This is the way it kind of would have found in nature. You can see each little hole here. This was a, a colonial rugose coral. So each uh, thakia hole here would have had one coral polyp living in it. And they're kind of a border that separates each one. So they're not completely separated from each other. They wouldn't have been touching except for maybe the top parts. And uh, the little radiating lines going in are the septa, and that's kind of what the corals held on to to stay in their shell. And then here's the famous Petoskey stones from Michigan. Same genus, same species, uh, but here they've been either polished by hand or polished by wave action on Lake Michigan. And you get to, to see it nice and polished, and you get to see the crenulated little lines and the, the septa radiating in towards the center and then the hole where the, the coral polyps would have lived. So same thing, just uh, polished by the, the natu natural ones are polished by the wave action. And then this is a sheep coral, Halicides. Um, this one may be from Illinois, it actually might be from Kentucky, because the Kentucky ones have a lot of um, this kind of orange iron oxide rust to it. And uh, again, it's a tabulate coral, and you can't see that they, they had little tablets, but these lack, lack the septa that the rugose corals have, so they just have these little holes. They're lined up like a chain, that's why they're called chain corals. Um, and in each little one of these individual holes would have been one small coral polyp that lived in there. And this is from the Silurian, a very common fossil here in Illinois and Wisconsin. Uh, annelids, these are the worms, and there are lots and lots of worms in the world. We're used to night crawlers uh, and the, the little red wiggly worms for fishing, but there are a lot of different types of marine worms. This one is, um, oh, I'm forgetting, the fire worms, which are the um, polychaetes. And polychaetes means many bristles, and you can see all the bristles sticking out on here. Um, and this would have been a worm. They still live today. I saw a live fire key in the Galapagos Islands, and we were warned. It was bright red, and we were warned not to touch it because it they said that the little needles break off and get in your skin. It's kind of like getting fiberglass, but there's also some kind of, some of them have a, a poison on them, which make it unpleasant. <laughs> so I didn't touch it, but I got some photos of it. And... Um, these, of course, are from the Maison Creek, or over 300 million years old right here from Illinois. I was going to say something else. About, oh, and then the lighting. So the Maison Creek is, can be tricky to take photographs of and get a good photo. So this one, we use low-angle lighting, which really brings out the texture in the rock. This is if you're going to advertise the holes in your bread, you know, like Wonder Bread or something, you want to advertise that, you'd use low-angle uh, lighting or raking lighting to, to bring that out. This one is using uh, cross-polarized lighting, where we put a polarizer film over the light source and then a circular polarizer on the, the camera lens. And you can tune that, 
And uh, you can see it's a real flat light. You don't get any of the texture, but it really brings out the color and saturation and the contrast. And so you can see things this way. The polarized light kind of bounces off the fossil in a unified way, but it bounces off the rock in kind of a random way, and that's why your filter just uh, gets rid of all that. And so you get this kind of nice smooth photo, uh, but bringing out sometimes details that it's very hard to see in the, the low angle lighting. And then we're in the brachiopods, which are still allowed today. They're kind of rare. You can find them in Puget Sound in uh, New Zealand and Australia. Um, but in the Silurian time, in the Paleozoic, these were the dominant shellfish. And this is one of the most common fossils you'll find in Illinois. This is a pentamerid called Kirkidium. Um, and this is a drawing from one of our interns who was a, we have some scientific illustrators that come in from Monica Jurig, uh, who created this. And you can see the shell. Uh oh, now I did it. Um, so we kind of improvised the color patterns based on fossil brachiopods from other periods. We didn't have a, a good pentamerid one that had a color pattern. And then inside here, you can see this sort of feathery structure. This is called the luffophore. It's an organ, and it would have had a little bit of a thin little bit of shell that went up and made a loop or a coil, and then it would have been covered with little cilia, and they beat back and forth. And that generates a little current bringing in water generally through the sides of the shell, and as the water comes out, they spit it out the center, and uh, they filter out any food with those little hairs and take it down to the mouth. So it's very different. They may look like a, a clam or a bivalve because they have uh, two shells, but the shells are a different size. Uh, the top shell is a different than the bottom shell, and the shells also have bilaterally, are bilaterally symmetrical, just like we are. If you split me down the center, my left side and right side are mirror images of each other. Same thing with these, and that's kind of the opposite of what a bivalve or, or clam would have. So here's a whole mess of spirifers from the Mississippian of, Ohio, of uh, Iowa. And this is all the same uh, species, but you can see the variation. You get smaller ones and bigger ones. Um, you know, maybe these are juveniles and adults. Maybe they just didn't grow because they were in a, a not a good environment. I believe these are all from the same bed. And so the, uh, all living together, all one species. And you can see that bilateral symmetry if you split this down the center. The left side and the mirror, right side is a mirror image. I don't have the bottom shell. I should have put some with the bottom shell up so you can see that the bottom shell looks different. The top shell has this indentation in the center. That's called the sulcus. And on the bottom shell, it has a fold, uh, the opposite of an indentation. I should have a word for that, but a little ridge. And then here we have another. Oh, here we got the top shell. You can see the sulcus on this perispirifer from the Devonian of Iowa and then the big fold on the, the bottom shell. So you can see the top and bottom shell are different looking, but again, you can split it in half. And I put this one in here, the schizophoria from, uh, this is actually from the Hay River up in the Northwest Territories of Canada. Uh, and you can see uh, lots of other organisms living on this shell. This is a bryozoan that's encrusting on it. There's a coral up here, there's a coral here, and they were probably encrusting on it when it was living because none of them cross the commissure line. This is where the two shells open. And so presumably, they were sitting there on the brachiopod shell uh, filtering water, probably because the brachiopod has a little bit of current because those, the luffophore is beating, bringing in water and food. And so a lot of stuff would encrust on these, uh, getting a little bit of extra food from the, the currents that the brachiopods are generating. You can see another type of, I think this is a bryozoan down here, a different type of bryozoan, maybe a coral. And then this is, uh, bryozoans are called moss animals. Um, you've probably stepped on a moss animal or bryozoan. If you've ever been in a lake or river that felt, uh, put your foot on a rock that was covered in algae, some of that algae most likely was bryozoans. Today, they're mostly soft. They have kind of a spongy um, shell to them. Uh, but, and some of them, and the marine ones still have a, a calcareous shell. But in the past, or at least in the past, all we have a record of in the fossil record are these calcareous shells. And so this is a big haloporid from the Ordovician in the Cincinnati area. This one's on display. And then this is Archimedes. This, is from, this one's actually from Illinois, but you can, a lot of them are in uh, Missouri. And this is a, a, a definitive, an index fossil. If you find uh, Archimedes as corkscrew column, you know you're in the Mississippian age. These are about 320, 330 million years old. Uh, this is the only time that these things lived. They would have had lacy fronds that came all the way out quite a distance. And they would have had thousands of little animals. They were colonial animals, thousands of them all working together to build this one structure. And if you go to the Field Museum and you walk on uh, Stanley Field Hall, the people often call it a marble tile, but they're really limestone, I would say. There are these Archimedes fossils in the limestone tiles. And um, you can find them. There's one 
in between the, uh, the Bistro and Maximo's uh, foot on the floor that has about three or four of them, so that's a good one to do. Or you can go to the northwest corner and go up that staircase, and the penultimate stair, second from the top, uh, has a really nice uh, Archimedes. I think actually that's where this photo is from. No, that's, but anyways, you can find uh, these all over the Field Museum's floor. So we know the floor is actually um, from Carthage, Missouri. It's a Mississippian rock, maybe the Warsaw Formation, um, with lots of crinoids, brachiopods, a few corals, and uh, quite a few uh, Archimedes bryozoans. And then when the mollusks, we don't have, mollusks don't make good fossils that last a long time. We have some from the Paleozoic, but they're made out of a different type of material. It's still calcium carbonate, but the crystals are aragonite, and they don't last as long as calcite. Most of the other fossils we have are, are made from calcite. Uh, it's a, just a different type of crystal. Calcite, or calcium, calcium carbonate can form two types of crystals, uh, either aragonite or, or calcite crystals. And, the mollusk shells don't last that long, so we tend not to get a lot from the Paleozoic. We get impressions and internal molds, but not actually the shells. And so this is a nice one from uh, near Chesapeake Bay, I think, um, in Virginia. Big scallop. Again, scallops are always the exception to the rule. They have bilateral symmetry, but most uh, other ones don't. So here we have a nice uh, bivalve shells, and you notice all of them have the same hole. This wasn't done by the Field Museum to display them or anything. This was done by a small little sh a snail, a narcissid, uh, narcissid snail, and they drill into these shells and then uh, stick in their radula, their, sort of their mouth, into the shell and eat the bivalve. And you can see they, they drill almost in the same place. Two of them are a little bit lower, but most of them are up high. And uh, you will find shells from all different ages that have these holes in them. So we know these gastropods were feeding on bivalves for a long time. So this is, and then, evidence of ancient life, so I would say, you know, you have two fossils, the, the bivalve and then the, uh, the trace fossil of what the gastropod left behind. Here's a really neat uh, oyster shell from Cretaceous of Arkansas. I, I just like the way this photo came out, it looks very silky. How big is that? It's about the palm of my hand. And this one here from England, you can see how this animal has a zigzag commissure line. This is where uh, it would open up. And so it probably lived in a sandy environment, and it could open the shell just a small amount to not let the sand in, but because it has so much area with the zigzags, it would allow a lot of water in, and it would help it feed more that way. So it would keep the sand out, but still have a, a big area of uh, opening, even though it didn't have to open too wide. And then we get into the gastropods. These are both Silurian from the same uh, genus. This one's from England, and you can see the preservation is really nice. Here in, uh, in um, Illinois, this is a, a very nice impression, but most of the time we just have internal molds, and so we lack the ornamentation that's on the outside of the shell. And so it's really nice to compare stuff from the Silurian of uh, the US, of Illinois, with uh, the Silurian of England, because we can see a lot more detail in the, the fossils. In England, they're all limestone, and here our fossils have all been kind of um, damaged by dolomite, the dolomization process. And uh, you get recrystallized larger crystals, and you lose a lot of the, the information, and a lot of the original shell and stuff is dissolved, and all we get are impressions and internal molds. There's a little illustration from another one of our interns, Tyler Ray. This is uh, two shells, and this is what they look like in normal lighting. And then you put UV on them, and you can see these were probably the color patterns. And it's still preserved, and the UV light reflects off of it, but they've faded under our light conditions. And this is common in some shells in Florida, particularly the ones that were exposed in, in the sunlight. For whatever reason, they faded. You can faintly see the pattern on this one, uh, but they really show up. They're still there, and you can see it under UV light, so that's kind of a neat uh, feature. You can also go with the UV light. Sometimes you can see the, uh, on the inside of the shell where the, the mantle was involved or covering it and where the muscle patterns were. Uh, where the muscles attached to the shell. This is a, a cephalopod, so this is one from the Solenhof. You can see the pen is fossilized. We got this one from a dealer, and so I always wonder how much of this is real soft-bodied stuff and how much was carved in. But the, the pen, this is an internal structure in squids, that's real. And so this one's actually out for research, and they're studying it and seeing which species it is and kind of determine uh, if this is a real soft-bodied impression or if this is sort of an artistic uh, interpretation of what it might have looked like. 
And then we have the, the Dawson Osiris. This is the most common fossil people bring in for me to identify. Um, they're fairly big. They can get up to three or four feet long. They got these nice ridges. Kids often think they're dinosaur tails. And you can see the one here is smooth, and we're seeing some ornamentation on here, but not a lot. But the one in England, you can see all kinds of growth lines and stuff on it. So again, from England and from Illinois. Um, and these would have been a little squid-like animal would have lived out to, oh, there we go. So Mary Williams, another intern who was a scientific illustrator. And you can see neat little squid living. This was their home and protection. And they could pump water in and out of the shell that would make them heavy. When they pump the water in and they pump the water out, they would float, so they worked just like a submarine. And that's why Captain Nemo named his submarine the Nautilus, because it works in the same way. And here's an ammonite. This one was actually on display during the, the World uh, Fair of 1893-92. And uh, this is from one of the original wards. All, we got the uh, field, when he donated money, he purchased the wards collection, the wards natural science establishment's collection, which was on display in the uh, second floor of the Anthropology Museum at the World's Fair in 1893. And so this is one of the original ward specimens. So he purchased 5,000 fossils, and this is one of the original 5,000 fossils. And so this is one shell. You can see the outside, and it was cut, and then you can see the inside, the chambers. These are the septo, and uh, they, you can't see the tube on this one, but it would have had a tube that ran through here there. It could fill those chambers up with water or pump the water out, and it would make it uh, buoyant or not. This, is, uh, this one is actually really neat. You can see the suture lines, which are real convoluted underneath here. But this is also some of the original shell material, and it, got, it has this iridescent purplish sheen to it. It's really pretty when you hold it and you turn it a little bit in the light. And so you got sort of both the shell and you can see inside the suture lines. And this was found in the 1850s, well before the Field Museum didn't open up until 1894. And so this one was found in 1850s by David Dale Owens, and he did an expedition through what was then called the, the Wisconsin and Dakota Territories. And this one, I think, was from Nebraska, or the Nebraska Territory. Um, and so this was at the University of Chicago. And so we have specimens that were collected well before the museum ever opened up, which is kind of neat. So this is one of the earliest uh, geology fossil expeditions in this area. And then here's a nice one. This is from the Devonian of Ohio. This middle part is matrix, just limestone. And so this would have been an open shell, and water would have been be able to flow around this shell. And most of the Nautilus that we saw, ammonites, are closed, tightly coiled. But this is a real loose coil. And that indicates that it probably was unstable in the water column, and so probably lived in a very calm or very uh, no currents, no wave action, just a real calm water. Otherwise, this thing would have got tossed around quite a bit. And then uh, we'll go into arthropods. We got insects trapped in amber. These are winged termites from the Dominican Republic. Um, we do get some insects in the Maison Creek. And then also, this is a damselfly from the, um, the Green River Formation. We do a lot of work. Lance Grandy goes out to the Green River every year with a group of high school students who get college credit. And they spend a couple of weeks at the museum learning how to prepare rocks and uh, what they're going to find out there. And then they go out there for two weeks camping and splitting open lots of rocks, and they bring back uh, the stuff. Mostly they find a lot of fish, of course, but occasionally you find a bird, a mammal, a reptile, and uh, a few insects and a few um, uh, crayfish and, uh, and uh, gastropods, snails. We got people ever wonder, these are the oldest cockroaches are about 300 million years old. Here's the evidence right here in the Maison Creek. And then this is uh, a trigna tarbid. This is a spider-like creature. It didn't have the spinneret, so it couldn't spin a web. It didn't make webs. Uh, but uh, these are arachnids, so included with the arthropods, but not insects. Here we have a millipede, quite a few millipedes in the Maison Creek. We get both, a lot of people are used to the jellyfish and the, the tully monsters and stuff, but we get a, both a, a shallow marine fauna and then also a terrestrial fauna. The terrestrial fauna is often called the braidwood fauna and the marine fauna, the Essex fauna, based on the the two towns where they're closely located. And then we get, of course, trilobites. And so here's a bumacid trilobite from England. And here's one that's named after the city of Chicago, Bumacid chicagoensis. Mostly we're just seeing the cephalon, the head part of it here. And it would have looked something like this. <laughs> These are supposed to be spots. We kind of made it like cow spots on this one. And blue eyes. I'm not sure how accurate that is. <laughs> 
But they did have compound eyes, and you'll be able to see this one is um, from England, but the eyes are missing. This is where they break apart. This is a suture line. And so when they molted, they would molt just like crabs and lobsters do and crawl out. And so this one here, you can see, is broken apart. It went right along where the eye goes. And so we can't see the eye on this one. And then this is the one from uh, Illinois. This is a celebra, uh, Calumnia celebra, or Calumnia celebra. And um, these are internal molds. So this is filled, this would have been filled with mud. And then we're just seeing the inside mold of that. And that's very common how we see them here. And here's a little illustration uh, from Walker Whalen on uh, what one might have looked like. Here's a really nice trilobite Cambrian from Nova Scotia, Paradoxites. You can find these in the Atlantic uh, coast of North America, parts of England, but not Scotland, and parts of Scandinavia, the Baltic region, and, and northern Germany, and, and Morocco. And people wondered why it's such a weird distribution. Why aren't they everywhere if they're there? And so when plate tectonics came along, it turned out that all these animals, these Paradoxites, lived on one kind of big island or small continent. Uh, the English called Avalonia after the King Arthur legends. Um, and that continent during the Cambrian was separated way to the south. And over time, plate tectonic forces pushed it north. It collided with the Baltic region of Europe. That then collided with North America with the first round of Appalachian, the mountain building events. And then finally, Africa and, and Morocco collided with it. And then when that, then that formed the supercontinent Pangaea. Uh, when Pangaea split apart, that little microcontinent was smeared across these other three areas, and that's how these got this weird distribution. So you can use fossils as kind of a paleogeography tool, uh, recreating what the continents looked like 520 million years ago. Oh, and here I got another grab a Columnia celebra. We also get some great horseshoe crab fossils preserved in the Maison Creek. Um, people think it's a living fossil, but there are differences. They, they're subtle and. and but they're not the same species, they're not even the same genus that's living today. And of course, this one's much smaller. This is uh, probably about the, as big as my thumb is. Oops. Um, so fairly small compared to the ones you find off the, you know, in, in South Carolina, North Carolina, where they get to be two, three feet long today. Here's a little cyclus. This is a strange, it had a shell, some little legs that stuck out, and some big antennas. We don't know much about these, probably swimming around, but the extinct group that's no longer living today Again, Maison Creek from here, from Illinois. Here's a nice, this, this is a prawn, a shrimp-like animal from the Solenhof of Jurassic in Germany. And then this is a crayfish from the um, Green River Formation in Wyoming again. The, and then this is kind of a unique, I've never seen this anywhere else. This is from Argentina. Uh, but this is what they think is a crayfish burrow. So the crayfish would make these little mud pellets and stack them up. Uh, presumably uh, underwater or on a riverbank. And then when the dry season came, it would crawl in here and survive the dry season living in the little burrow and then come out. So I've never seen a fossil crayfish burrow before, so it's just sort of a weird, unique thing, which I never would have recognized until I saw it here at the Field Museum. <laughs> and then we get finally into the echinoderms. So we got uh, echinoids, the, the sea urchins, and the sand dollars. And of course, from the Bundenbach, uh, the Hunsruck slate of Germany, the Devonian, we get these. Uh, Beautiful starfish. And then someone brought in the, the crinoid part. This is a calyx of the crinoid. Here are the arms. And um, it would have had a long stem that came off of it. You can see it here. And, um, and those are from Indiana, from the, uh, the Silurian out there. I, I should know the name of that, but I can't think of it right now. Um, but we often find this gastropod, this platycerus gastropod, on top of the crinoid. And crinoids, when they evolved, and here you can see one in the, this is a model at the diorama at the Milwaukee Public Museum. They often evolved these kind of chimneys, and this is called an anal chimney. This is where it got rid of its waist. So it had a mouth that was low down. It would eat stuff. The arms would pass food to the mouth with tube feet, just like a starfish. And then it would eat, digest it, and the waste would come out here up high. So it works just like, a real, like our chimneys so that the waste didn't contaminate the arms and it didn't re eat what it already ate. But apparently, these gastropods like to cement themselves right over the anal chimney and reprocess the crinoid's waste. So to sum it up, it is a poop eater. <laughs> kind of neat that we can spot this kind of symbiotic relationship that's 430 million years old. And there's a little illustration of one. And here you can see um, 
very rare. There's only probably about uh, 10 of these ever found where you get the calyx, the arms, the entire stem, and then actually the hold fast, sometimes called the root. This was just used to hold the crinoid in place. They often lived in high current environments, and so this would keep them stable. They didn't get nutrients or anything from the seafloor. This was just to hold them in place. And the Waldron Shale, this is all from the Waldron Shale in Indiana, Silurian. And you get a beautiful preservation, very unusual. And you'll also notice that the crinoid columnals, these little discs that form the stem, are different shape. They're kind of smooth down here. You got ridges up here and then smooth again up here. And that probably has something to do with how they would bend in the current. And I know Roy Plotnick uh, is doing some testing on that in the current with actual water currents and trying to see how the, it was more rigid or, or more flexible because of that. And then we also get these neat cystoids, which are kind of like crinoids, but a little bit different. More plates, uh, a bigger body. This one's from England. You can see the nice preservation. And this one is from Illinois. And each one of these individual plates would have been a single crystal of calcite. And then here's what uh, one of these would have looked like in a drawing by Monica again. Um, it didn't have a hold fast. This would either coil around a, a piece of coral or algae or bur burrow in the sand. You have some encrusting corals you sometimes find on the stems. And here you can see the real long feathery arms and the two feet that would have captured food and brought it all down to the center where the, the mouth would be. And this is a beautiful slab from the, the Bundenbach in Germany showing this, this one and this one is the same species of crinoid. Then we have a different crinoid here and we have a brittle star over here. So they would quarry this for a roofing slate and often find these really well-preserved. Uh, you can find trilobites, uh, phacops, um, lots of crinoids, brachiopods, all kinds of fossils in this uh, black slate uh, in, uh, the, from the early Devonian of Germany. And then finally, we got, of course, some chordates, what we think are vertebrates, the Tully monster. This is the official state fossil of Illinois, found nowhere else, 307 million years old, right here in the Maison Creek. It's a soft-bodied animal. There's no bones in it, but we still think it's a, uh, one of a group of the jawless fish. This is the mouth up here. We found some fossils that have a digestive tract that comes up here, so that's why we know this is the mouth. This would have been the eye bar. This is where the eyes would have sat off on little stalks. The eye bar is fairly rigid, and we think it was made out of cartilage, just like our, our ears and nose are made out of. And here you can see this is the holotype. This is the one that uh, Richardson, uh, Eugene Richardson at the museum used to describe it. Here's one of the eyes here. The second eye is hard to see, but the, the proboscis comes up, curls around and goes across the body, and the other eye is right here. And then we see Richardson thought that these black stripes would have been segments, and that's why he thought it was like a worm-like creature. But we think they're actually myomeres, muscle bundles. So if you ever had a nice piece of salmon that kind of flakes apart in those thin little pieces, we think that's the same thing going on with the Tully monster, that this died, started to decay a little bit, and the muscle bundles broke apart. And uh, that's why we get these uh, little lines. Instead of segments, we think they're uh, myomeres. And here you can see the tail kind of diamond-shaped, sort of like a squid's tail. So very strange, unusual fossil. We looked at about 1,200 of them, find some characteristics in about a dozen of them that led us to think it's probably because we found gill pouches, um, archaealia, little cartilaginous nodules along here, all indicating that it was probably some kind of fish, but no bones. And so we think that probably the closest living relative would be the lampreys which again, don't have bones, but just cartilage, and they're, called, they're in a group called the agnathans, the jawless fish. But again, the Tully monster is very different looking than the lamprey. Um, so a very strange animal, really a good fossil. Found originally by Francis Tully in 1955. He brought it to the museum in 58, and Richardson published and gave it the name Tully monstrum gregarium, the common Tully monster, after Francis Tully in 1966. Okay, so back to the talk. <laughs> So one of the reasons I wanted all those fossils was just kind of give you the idea of the, the scope of our collection, just how many different things we deal with. No one can be an expert in all of these things. And so we have these big, long rows of cabinets. Um, there's really two types of folks who work with the, in geology at the Field Museum. Well, three. We have preparators who prepare the fossils. Uh, and then we have collection managers who really are focused on maintaining the collection, keeping track of all the, the items, finding stuff when people need them, putting stuff away. <clears throat> and, and sort of like a librarian, loaning them out, giving them all numbers and stuff like that. And the curators do primarily research. Um, but collection managers also do a, a little bit of their own research if they want. They do educational outreach programming. And so there's a lot of overlap. And now, traditionally, collection managers did not have a, a PhD when they were hired. They normally had a, 
uh, a bachelor of science or a master's of science. Uh, but today, the last six or seven new collection managers we hired all have PhDs. And so they're trying to do more research, bring in grants and stuff. And so it's really starting to get a little bit fuzzy, the difference between collection managers and curators. Uh, you know, look at the paycheck. That's one good way of telling who's who. But um, <laughs> um, there is a lot of overlap in what people do and stuff. And it's changing all the time. So I guess that's what I wanted to just say is there's a lot of changes going on right now with that. Um, but really, I'm in charge of the two million fossils here stored in this collection area. And here you can see another view looking down again, all these rows. Um, and uh, this is the whole collection area. So that picture was taken here, and you could see uh, this, this desk and this uh, table over here, and you could just see a glimpse of this. I can go back one. There you go. You can see the elevator here. And so that's just one row out of about, uh, what do we got, 10 rows there. So, uh, so we have about... Uh, uh, I think it's 558 cabinets. Each cabinet can hold 25 drawers, so that's about 14,000 drawers if you do the math, and about 2 million total specimens, <coughs> but kind of divided up into um, 350,000 specimen lots. And a lot is just simply a box filled with one fossil, or maybe 10 fossils, or maybe 100 fossils, probably sometimes 1,000 fossils. And they're all, that would be like brachiopods that all came from the same bed that would make up one lot. And so, when I digitize, I do it by lot, not by individual specimens. So I don't have to digitize 2 million specimens. I have to digitize 350,000 specimens, <laughs> or specimen lots, I should say. So how often do you reorganize? I've never reorganized. <laughs> <laughs> I have reorganized the Nidera. I, we need to reorganize the Maison Creek aisle because we've got so many new stuff coming in, we don't have room for it. And so I redid the, the Nidarians, the jellyfish, and uh, there's not many corals in the Maison Creek, but the jellyfish and the, the sea anemones. And that uh, took me and an intern uh, like two days, and I was exhausted and tired. And so if we do, when I do, I'm going to have to move every uh, drawer in the Pennsylvania aisle, which I don't know how many that is, but um, it's going to be, I don't know, 10, uh, I don't know, a couple thousand drawers, and I don't want to do that. So I may hire a moving company to come in and just have them move it, and we'll have it all organized and figure out where they go. But it's a lot of work. The drawers are heavy, and uh, I really need a really, really good reason to reorganize. <laughs> it's a lot of work. And then also I forget where things are. <laughs> and so this is kind of breaking up the collection by geologic period, by time. So the Cambrian is oldest at about 530, 520 million years old, 450, 430, uh, 380 roughly, 320, 307 both Pennsylvania and Maison Creek, and then 250, and then the green ones are the Mesozoic, so that's roughly uh, 65 million years ago to 250 million years ago, and then the yellow is Cenozoic. And the types are of animals that have been either just assigned as a holot type of a critter, or we also put in figured or referred things. So anything that's been published on us in a, uh, in a scientific article goes into the type collection, and we, that can be any of these things. That can be all of them. And so those are probably our most important ones, and that needs to be digitized. A lot of these are already digitized, actually, but we need to go through it and photograph a lot of the types. The Maison Creek has also been digitized, the, the data, but again, a lot of them have not been photographed. And so what I started out with is I got a, a grant to digitize. Our first one was through the Silurian Reef uh, fossils and then the Ordovician, and now we're working on the Devonian, which is our biggest group. Whoops, keep doing that. And uh, hopefully I'll get one to do the Mississippian and then the Pennsylvanian, and I'll have at least a, the lion's share of the stuff done. And again, this is mostly what we work with. We do get some folks who look at some of this, but as you can see, this makes up the, the vast majority of our collection. And so this is, uh, over the last 12 summers, interns have digitized, and more than half of our digitized records now have been done by uh, interns coming in during the summer. So lots of folks coming in. We have these nice cameras, copy stands, and these fancy thin screen computers. Um, the first digitization actually started in the 1980s with Scott Litgard, and um, he, they digitized 35,000 Maison Creek specimens. But again, they, all they did was enter the data into the computer. And back then, there was a lot of limits on how much information you could type in. So you got cut off if you were long descriptions and stuff. And uh, no photos whatsoever. So just really putting uh, information into the computer. 
And this is Eugene, uh, this is Eugene uh, Richardson, if you're wondering, and Rainier Zangrel at the Mecca Quarry looking over some presumably fossil shark fossils and uh, the old geology hall at the museum, a couple of Mason Creek fossils just for fun. And so now going over the last 12 years or so, I started out with a little test with an unpaid intern. He was a high school student that kept coming in and wanted to do stuff. So we digitized the cephalopod type collection, which had not been done before. And that was a fairly small 633 specimens. And then we used the information from this project to apply for the Silurian IMLS grant, how long it takes and all that kind of stuff. And we were able to get a grant here and for three summers. And Alex then came in and was part of this for two years in 2013 and 2014. And uh, we did about 20,000 specimens for that. We just finished up the Ordovician where we had 13,000 specimen lots uh, digitized. And we're just starting the Devonian uh, where, we've, where this summer we got about uh, 7,000, uh, a little over 7,000 done. We've also done some, we've gotten in a couple new collections from the Thomas V. Testa and James and Sylvia Konechny. And so I've been having some of the summer um, women in science interns working on these and digitizing them because I don't want to increase our backlog any more than it already is. I'm holding this up like it's a microphone, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also did one research digitization project on the Tully monsters. So we um, had a group come in and they wanted to look at when we were deciding that this was actually a, a fish rather than a worm or a gastropod or whatever else, the many other things people thought a Tully was. And so we digitized close to 5,000 images, but a lot of them, we have four images for each specimen, uh, both low angle lighting and then the polarized lighting from each, each half, each part and counterpart. And so we have uh, all these, and these are all available online. You can either go to the Field Museum's website, um, Fossil Invertebrate Field Museum, and click on the, the database search there, and you can find the photos. Or there's a site called GBIF, G-B-I-F. And if you type in GBIF Fossil Invertebrate Field Museum, you'll get all of our stuff there. Um, that's the Global Bioinformation Network. I don't know what the F stands for, foundation, something like that. Uh, and so we have it uh, two different places uh, shared, and other people may be picking up and taking that data and putting it elsewhere. But all the, the fossil images and stuff, well, the Devonian isn't up yet. I'm still, and actually, some of the Ordovician isn't up yet. I'm still working on that. Uh, we have to upload that. But uh, by wintertime, all this should be up there. And uh, certainly, the Tully monsters are all there now. So if you want to look at 4,000 images of Tully monsters, they're available. <laughs> and you can look uh, for as long as you want. So we've done about 57,000 specimens uh, using interns during the summertime to digitize this stuff. And this is just sort of a chart of my record. The different colors are different projects. Uh, WC is a World Columbian Exposition. The GDI was a grant, that, a small grant, where we did uh, some of the uh, Maison Creek type specimens. Whoops. And uh, then the, the big one here, and you can see when the summer starts, one, two, three summers, and they go up and in between it's kind of flat. And uh, this was the IML Silurian one. Here's um, the Tom Testa was a big collection, and we had one, two summers of that, or two times we worked on it. Uh, this is the Konechny collection in yellow, and then the pink is the Ordovician. So we have one, two, the pandemic, where not a lot was done, and then three after the pandemic. And then here we have the, the second round of Konechny stuff. There will be a third round, too. And then here we have our first Devonian one. And I go in the future a little bit, but uh, we won't add anything probably to the Devonian one until... Uh, May or, or June of uh, next year. And then this is just showing how a number of images, uh, photos have grown in our collection. And we start out with zero, and then we're now up to over almost 100,000 photos uh, of fossils. And, and the labels, we think the labels are crucial. Uh, that's the original raw data. And so you could use that to check if we mistype stuff into our database or if it was misspelled on the label to begin with. <laughs> It's just a good way of checking stuff, and it's really good to have the original source material there. And again, the color coder for each project. You see the Tully is in yellow, so we have a lot of photos for the Tully. Um, but there's no Tullys that were added because all the Tully monsters were already in the, the database. And then this is the first year. This is Alex who started it all off with Nicole and Lindsay, my first three interns who worked on the, Devonia, uh, the Solarian Reef uh, stuff. And we had one small little office and kind of cramped, and we only had one copy stand, so we had to switch uh, people between them when they're taking photos or not. So it was a little bit of a bottleneck. And now we got uh, everyone gets their own copy stand, their own camera, so we can go through much quicker than we were able to before, adding a lot more stuff, uh, information, data, which is the key thing for fossils into this. And then here's 
a little bit. This was a, a slide where we hope to continue, but we're now continuing. I should say all these have been in partnership with the Milwaukee Public Museum. So they're digitizing their collection along with us, and we both apply together for the grant. So we're partners, and we get uh, two collections done for the price of one. And we share the same database. So you can look at the Field Museum. You can find Field Museum and Milwaukee Public Museum stuff all together. And then just quickly, I'll go through um, the photogrammetry workstation. So this is Ralph Kugler, and he worked in um, a couple of oil consultant things, including Schlumberger, where he would do 3D modelings of whole oil fields and also porosity of sandstone, very small things, all in 3D. And so he's really good at 3D modeling and stuff. And he, a uh, native of Milwaukee, and so he went to the Milwaukee Public Museum where he's retired now, and he was uh, volunteering there, and he came up with this making 3D uh, models up there. And I saw some of that, and I said, holy man, this is neat. <laughs> And so I invited him down, and he came down, and we were able to set up a, a, a workstation so that we can make our own 3D models. And uh, we got some funding from the Women's Board at the Field Museum. And this is Avery Williams. She applied for one of our internships, but I noticed that she, had, uh, she was an art student, and she had 3D uh, computer programming for video games. And I said, you know what? This might work out a lot better for photogrammetry. <laughs> and so I hired her for that, and she did a wonderful job, really helped setting up stuff and doing a lot of it, because I had very little experience and didn't know much to do, and she uh, grasped it better than I did some parts of it. So did a great job on that. This is where the little box that we have where we put the fossil and we photograph it, the camera's on a, a tripod. And there you can see the camera. The fossil is this teeny thing in the center. This is like a Lazy Susan that spins around automatically, and it just spins, and we take a picture every um, uh, 10 degrees, I think, so we get about 36, 35 photos for each uh, fossil as it spins around. And then we change the orientation so it's rotated, and then we take another 35. So for each 3D model, it's 70 photos uh, that are used to make it. And that's, they're called orbits. And so here you can see the photos around the orbit one time and around one time. We don't change the camera, we just change how the specimen is, so it's a lot easier. <laughs> and then we get this sort of 3D model here. Uh, this is out of a mesh, and you can look, there's, I forget how many little uh, triangle faces and stuff, you can look at all that, but uh, we get, they're really dense. And then we can drape over a, a JPEG texture to make it look like the actual fossil, and that works out really well. And here you can see some examples. And again, these aren't online, but they will be hopefully by the end of this year or very early next year. Uh, it'll be very early next year. <laughs> Nothing gets done in December. <laughs> there you go. So, And then just to show you, and I've talked about all this nice stuff, and I look pretty good. I got 65 or 57,000 things in there, but it's not me doing it alone. And I, people often just show a bunch of names and stuff. But here's Pat Burke, Patricia Burke, up at the Milwaukee Public Museum, and her fossils. These are the interns before the pandemic. There's Alex in the first three. Um, this is one of our artists, Mary Williams. Um, two more of our artists, Miranda and uh, Mar Miranda and Monica. So we had a lot of M's at first, but then we got uh, Alex, so it kind of ruined the M trend. <laughs> and then these are the people who came after the pandemic. These were our virtual interns who did most of it online, but they did come down to visit the museum once, so they got to see at least a collection and some fossils. And then two women in science interns who did the Konechnia uh, fossils. And the group that was here this summer for the Devonian. And then again, Avery uh, Williams, who did a great job for two summers on the, the 3D photogrammetry. And she even created a little PowerPoint uh, how to do it so that when I forget what she told me, I can look it up on that. <laughs> <laughs> and then we also had a, a geology assistant for a while. She went up to Minnesota to get her advanced degree. Uh, Kathy Wiegand did a lot of help. Monty is an amateur photographer who's helped take a lot, of, a lot of photos. Uh, Janelle helped to put those in. She's now moved out to Seattle. And then many of you may know Jack Wittry. He does uh, a lot of work here in Illinois on the Maison Creek and has uh, two or three books published on the Maison Creek. So he's a super volunteer, as I call him. <laughs> and then we have, I should also mention the technology department, which has been a huge help in putting all this into the database and making websites. And so that's the, that was my former geologist a friend collector uh, at the Thornton Quarry. And then me, Sharon Grant, PJ from the Milwaukee Public Museum. This is Rob Zertsky, who is the head of IT. Kate Webbink, who does a lot of EBU uh, stuff. 
uh, Mark and Kate, and then Pete Herbst is really the one who, we, the virtual Sawyer and Reef, he's the one who kind of recreated that. And it pulls all the information out of our, this is how well I remember stuff. He, pulled, uh, he uses an API program that he created to pull out information from our database and put it online. So when you go online and you search our database, you're not really going into our database, so you can't do anything bad to our database. Um, and so an API is, he always said it was like a gear, and it, it would turn, pick up the data from the, the EMU database, turn it and put it back up into the web uh, HTML uh, database. And so that's all I can tell you about that, other than if you want the API for removing information from EMU and putting it into the database, it's free and we developed it. <laughs> so you're welcome to use it. <laughs> And let's see, I think that's the last slide. But... Oh, I got the artist too. So this is just pretty pictures of a lot of illustrations that uh, they've all done and really help make, uh, bring out details and stuff and make it easier for me to explain. Sometimes I'll talk about this and people think this is a tentacle or something, but when they see the image, they know right away what's going on. So the artists have really done a great job. Part of this is based on science and what we can find in the fossil. And then blue coloring is, you know, artistic uh, license and a little bit of skill because we don't know what color they were. There's Monica and some of her images. Monica really was good with brachiopods, I thought. Again, everyone likes giving trilobites blue eyes, I'm not sure. <laughs> and this is Miranda. She was the only one I had a bunch of asked them to do uh, this, but... You had to do so many of these little tentacles. A lot of them did it on computers, and uh, they did so many tentacles it would bog down the computer, and they couldn't do it. So she did that one by hand, and it worked out well. <laughs> and then Tyler and uh, Walker. And then finally Alex, who did a lot of the Ordovician material. And here you can see I talked about the crinoids wrapping themselves around the algae. And we think it was algae because we find them coiled and wrapped but nothing there, and so we think the algae wasn't preserved, and that's what they, they were wrapped around, but we're not seeing it in the fossil record. And then the platystrophia. All right, so thank you. If I close this down. Oh, you're welcome. So these are some of the 3D models. So this is an ammonite, and you can just move this around, look at it from any angle that you want, you can zoom in and see the detail. It's pretty well. You can get a little too close. <laughs> and then we also have, um, this is a nice trilobite from the Ordovician of uh, St. Petersburg. You can see the eyes are up here. And I think you can see it at least on one side of it. It's well enough preserved. Oops, I just get the other side. You can see the, um, I can't get any closer. But you should be able to see some of the little, um, the fact that it's a compound eye and all the little lenses. But uh, you can look at it from any angle. You can even read our collection numbers and stuff on it. <laughs> and if people want and they want to come up here and play around with these, you can. Here's another one from the Devonian of Morocco. And uh, There you can see the eye stuff here. So it's pretty, uh, this is just a texture that's wrapped over it. Um, the actual thing is just little polygons that the computer makes. You can see the saw marks where we cut this. Actually, someone else cut it. And I'm not sure who Carol95 is, but, <laughs> but this is one that someone donated to us. Here's a platystrophia, a brachiopod from the Ordovician, probably from the Cincinnati area. Oops, there's the ammonite, and then I think I got... Oop, we got one more we can, didn't fill in. So really neat 3D stuff. We're not going to do all the fossils. It takes way too much time to ever do all of them. But the really nice ones and the ones that have sort of a 3D nature to them will do. There's one I didn't bring. I didn't have it with me. But uh, it's a big bryozoan. And if you flip it over, you see an impression of a brachiopod shell. So it actually started growing on the brachiopod shell. And then the brachiopod uh, died, dissolved away, and all we have left is the impression. But... It kind of gives you an idea that, that what, during the Silurian, there's probably huge square miles of uh, seafloor covered with these pentamerid brachiopods, and they kind of laid the foundation. And once they were there, corals, bryozoans, and other things started encrusting on them and grew up on top of that, and that's how the reefs got started. So just like today when we have a fire, the first animals that come in are the, or the plants are the ferns, and they kind of recolonize it. And then after the ferns are done and 
putting in some nutrients in the soil and stuff. Other plants start growing there. Same thing with the pentamered bracket pots. They're kind of the first group that would come in and do that um, on the seafloor. So some differences, but some similarities. Any questions? Concerns? Yes. <laughs> 